All right, let's talk about accrued expenses and accrued revenues. Now we're talking about those costs that are incurred in a particular period, but they are not paid yet and have not been recorded yet. They're also referred to as accrued liabilities. So accrued expenses have to be reported on the income statement for the period when they're incurred. So you've incurred the expense, but you haven't paid it yet. But you want to place it in the period in which it actually applies to. So some common examples of that are salaries, interest, rent, and taxes. So let's look at salaries and interest, because those might be the most common ones that we have. If you have payroll, if you're paying your employees, um, at the end of a particular accounting period, people have worked, but they may not have been paid yet because if the pay period um, overlaps two particular uh, accounting periods, then like in this case, employees are paid every two weeks. On Friday, on December 12th and 26th, the wages are paid, recorded in the journal and posted to, up to the ledger. So the problem here is, is that you have three more working days after December 26th that the employee is going to work, but they're not going to be paid until the following year. However, those three days, the 29th, 30th, and 31st, should be recorded in this accounting period, not the next accounting period, not in the one that's, that they're going to get paid in January. So the way that we do that is you figure out what the ex salary expense would be for those three days. In this case, they're saying it's uh, $1,610. That's what's being reported I'm sorry, let me look at this example a little more closely. Salaries expenses 1610 is reported on the December income statement, but 210 of that is not reported on the balance sheet. If you don't make that adjustment, you're going to overstate your net income because you're understating the salary expense. You don't have the $210 that applies to those three days in the correct period. It's in the January period, not the December period. So in order to do that, we have to do this particular adjustment. You have to figure out what the expense is for those three days, put it in the salaries expense account, and then credit salaries payable. So you're increasing the liability here because this is what is owed in salaries at the end of December. This is the amount of the expense. Now in January when you actually pay those salaries we're going to get rid of this and it'll end up reversing itself because we will post a debit here once we pay it in January. So here's your example. Before you do the adjustment, the salaries payable says zero because you don't have anything up here. You realize that you've got $210 in expense for those three days. So the adjustment is to add $210 to salaries payable and add $210 to salaries expense. So this is going to end up in the correct year. And then after the adjustment, the account, the salaries payable account is going to say 210 but that'll get paid on the first pay period in January. Same thing is true with, a, with accrued interest expenses. Most companies have some type of loan and they're accruing interest on those um, loans or those notes payable um, at the end of a particular period. But you want to make sure that you've got the correct amount of interest expense recorded in the correct period. So in this example, if a company has a $6,000 loan from a bank at 6% annual interest, then 30 days accrued interest expense would be $30. So this is how you compute that. So the adjusting entry would be to debit interest expense for $30 and credit interest payable for $30. So adjusting entry for accrued expenses foretell cash transactions in future periods. Okay, so when you're doing that adjusting entry because you know you're going to have to pay that in a future period, but you are incurring it now. 
the expense exists, but you're not going to pay it until the next accounting period. So we talked about fast forward having accrued salaries of $210. Well, on January 9th, when they actually pay that, this is what it would look like, as I said before. You would debit accounts payable for 210. In this case, you're going to debit the rest of the payroll for that particular period to salaries expense, because this is the period in which it belongs. And then the credit would go to cash. So the 210 takes care of the amount that you had set up here. That's from December. The rest of this, the 490, is the amount of salary expense in January that covers this particular accounting period. So these are two examples of how to do um, accrued expenses. You've got salaries and you have interest, and those are two very common ones. Make sure you look at this carefully and, and make sure that you understand it, because I know that accrued uh, expenses and revenues can be confusing and um, after listening to what I've had to say go back and look at this and make sure you understand what we're talking about. Now let's turn to the accrued revenues. This is just the, the opposite of what we just talked about. These are now um, revenues that you have earned. I mean you've performed the services, you've provided the product, but you haven't yet received the money. So an example is a technician who bills his customers only when the job is done. So let's say you have an electrician that comes to your house and he's done the work, but he doesn't charge you in advance. So he gives you a bill and he's waiting for you to pay that. So here's an example. If one third of a job is complete by the end of the period, then the technician must record one third of the expected billing as revenue in that period, even though he hasn't gotten his money yet. So the adjusting entries would look like this. Um, well, first of all, accrued revenues commonly arise from services, products, interest, and rent. We use service fees and interest to show how to adjust. So here's how you would adjust service revenue. Accrued revenues are not recorded until adjusting entries are made at the end of the accounting period. These accrued revenues are earned but unrecorded because either the buyer has not yet paid for them or the seller has not yet billed the buyer. So let's look at our company fast forward. In the second week of December, it agreed to provide 30 days of consulting services to a local fitness club for a fixed fee of $2,700. The terms of the initial agreement call for fast forward to provide services from December 12th to January 10th, or that's 30 days of service. The club agrees to pay them $2,700, but not until January 10th. So the problem here is that you have 30 days, I mean, excuse me, 20 days of service between December 12th and the end of December. So you would have provided the services, so you've earned the revenue, but you haven't received it yet. So this is the adjustment that you would have to make. They've earned two-thirds of the 30-day fee. So they've already earned two-thirds of it, which is $1,800. The revenue recognition principle implies that it must report the $1,800 on the December income statement, not on the January one. So this is what they have to do. First of all, they would put accounts receivable $1,800 because they're expecting to receive $1,800 for that particular period and then they would put a credit to consulting revenue. So you debit accounts receivable because you don't have the money yet, but you are expecting to receive it. This is an asset and the credit goes to the revenue account because you already earned this revenue. So here's your explanation. It reports accounts receivable at $1,800. If you didn't do this adjustment, you would understate the revenue and you would also understate your accounts receivable, so your assets would be understated as well. Another example has to do with interest revenue. You may have accrued interest expense, you may also have accrued interest revenue. 
So if your holding is a company, notes or accounts receivable that produce interest revenue, we have to adjust those accounts to record any earned interest but yet uncollected interest. So accrued revenues at the end of one accounting period result in cash receipts in a future period. So you've earned the revenue in this period, the first period, but you're not going to receive the money until the next period. And that's what you're trying to adjust for. You want to make sure that the revenue that you've earned is recorded in the correct period. So once you actually get the money, that, you know, $1,800 that that company owes you, you have to credit accounts receivable and then you debit cash for the amount that you received. Now, in this case, when you actually receive the money, you're getting the full $2,700. $1,800 of it cancels out the accounts receivable. The other $900 is considered revenue in the, in the January period because 10 of those days are in January. So this is how the um, entry would close itself out. Now, what's a, another step that's important here is understanding when you do these, adjust, do these adjusting entries, how does it affect your financial statements? And this chart here explains what happens in terms of your financial statements. Because what you're trying to do, the reason why you're doing these adjusting entries is because you're trying to get your assets and liabilities to the correct amount. But in doing those in trying to get those assets and liabilities to the correct amounts, you're affecting expenses and revenues as well. So this chart summarizes the four types of transactions that we've talked about, the, the types that require these adjustments. And remember that each adjusting entry affects one or more income statement accounts and one or more balance sheet accounts, but it never affects cash. So if you have prepaid expenses, before the adjustment, your asset is going to be overstated and equity is going to be overstated on your balance sheet. On your income statement, the expense is understated. So this is what you have to do over here to correct that. This is where, what you do to the adjusting entry. I'm not going to go through all of this. You can look at the chart. But this is an important chart for you to look back at when you're trying to understand adjusting entries. If you can begin to get a feel for this and realize what is being adjusted and why, um, adjusting entries will become pretty commonplace for you. Um, also, timing. Information about these adjustments is not always available until several days after the period ends. So sometimes those adjusting entries are taking place um, you know, not right on the end, the last day of that particular accounting period. So keep that in mind um, that you may not have all the information you need until uh, days or even weeks after the accounting period has ended. All right, now we talked before about a trial balance and how a trial balance helps you prepare your financial statements because it makes sure that your debits and credits are in balance. Um, but a trial balance is initially done before you do these adjustments. And so that's what it says here. An adjusted trial balance is a list of accounts and balances prepared before adjustments are recorded. But then there's an adjusted trial balance, which is a list of those accounts after the adjusting entries have been recorded. And the picture that you see here shows you a combination of those things. Because typically what we do is we have um, the adjusted trial balance in the first two columns, debits and credits, then this shows the adjustments that you're going to make. And as you can see, there's letters here. Um, so the letter A here is going to correspond with the A over here. So the debits and the credits have to equal themselves in your adjustments. So here's a $100 debit, here's a $100 credit. So you always have to make sure that the debits and credits equal in adjustments. And as you can see here, when they're totaled up, they do equal. Once you do these adjustments, then you do the adjusted trial balance where you deduct this or add this to whatever was over here. <clears throat> so as you can see here, cash doesn't change. It comes over. 
There was nothing in accounts receivable here, but you've adjusted it by $1,800, so now that balance is an $1,800 debit. So you just take that across with each account, and you end up with an adjusted trial balance, which now, again, the debits have to equal the credits. So this helps you know whether or not you have kept, if you've done the adjustments correctly, and you've kept the debits and credits in balance. <clears throat> Once you've done your adjusted trial balance, you again can use this to prepare your financial statements, um, just as we talked about in Chapter 2 in terms of using the, uh, the unadjusted trial balance to do that. But now we would be using the adjusted trial balance to perform or to prepare our financial statements. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the next video.